everyone. Uh, this is Jeff with Mississippi in the Civil War, uh, bringing you another uh, episode. Uh, last month, uh, in fact, uh, June 10th of 1864, there was a major battle in Mississippi. It's uh, considered one of the, the all-time great cavalry battles of the Civil War. And uh, last month was the 157th anniversary of the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, Mississippi. Wish I could have done this uh, on the actual anniversary, but uh, my time being what it is, I don't have uh, quite the uh, the time or energy to put into uh, some of these episodes that I would like. So sometimes they come out a little bit late. But uh, uh, sometime back, I found a really interesting account of the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, written by a, a Union soldier who fought in the battle. And his account was published in uh, a Mississippi newspaper, the Southern Sentinel of Ripley, Mississippi. It was published uh, November 1st, 1906. And uh, I'd just like to share with you this account. It was written by a soldier named Cornelius A. Stanton. And at the time of the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, he was captain of Company I of the 3rd Iowa Cavalry. And uh, this story, uh, it's, it's a good story. I like telling these first-person accounts by individuals who were actually involved in these actions. But uh, the 3rd Iowa Cavalry at the time of the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads was part of the Cavalry Division commanded by Brigadier General Benjamin Grierson. And uh, his brigade, uh, the 3rd Iowa's brigade, was the 2nd Brigade made up of the 3rd Iowa Cavalry, uh, the 4th Iowa Cavalry, the 10th Missouri Cavalry, the, uh, and the 7th Independent Battery, Wisconsin Light Artillery. And this story uh, was written by Stanton uh, uh, for uh, a particular audience. He was uh, part of a uh, group that were getting ready to uh, celebrate the dedication of the Iowa Monument at the Vicksburg National Battlefield. And uh, Stanton, uh, as he was now a resident of Vicksburg, was kind of tapped to uh, uh, greet the uh, Iowans that came down for this event. And so this, uh, this account was really, I think, written with them in mind. But uh, it, the uh, story starts off uh, with Stanton uh, with a, in, a, with a, in a big uh, headline saying, A Federal Soldier Story. Personal Recollections of the Battle at Bryce's Crossroads, June 10th, 1864. And he starts off by saying, It may interest the veterans of Forest Cavalry to read a brief description of some of the incidents in one of their great battles as they appeared to a soldier who was present on the Federal side. In General Sherman's book, his memoirs, he states that in the summer of 1864, while engaged in the Atlanta campaign, he feared that General Forrest would cross the Tennessee River with his cavalry and break up the railroad in the rear of Sherman's army. And in, and in, in anticipation of this danger, he sent General Sturgis to Memphis with orders to take command of a force of cavalry and infantry and, quote, go out toward Pontotoc, engage Forrest, and defeat him. General Sturgis, who's shown in this inset picture here, uh, carried out the first part of his instructions, but when he met General Forrest, instead of defeating him, he was himself defeated, and the Federal forces under his command were utterly routed with great loss of men, artillery, small arms, wagons, rations, ammunition, and other Army equipments. And that's a pretty, pretty fair summary of what happened. But... Uh, uh, Stanton's account is going to go into a little bit more detail than that. But uh, the Sturgis expedition, uh, commanded by Brigadier General uh, Samuel D. Sturgis, uh, consisting of Grierson's Division of Cavalry, uh, which was uh, made up of Winslow's and Waring's brigades, and about 5,000 infantry, uh, left Memphis on June 1st, 1864, up, up here in the top left-hand corner. And in the... Uh, and I was then the captain of a company in the 3rd Iowa Cavalry attached to Winslow's Brigade, and I shall not attempt to describe the Battle of Price's Crossroads in detail, but only the small part which I saw and in which I was engaged with my company and regiment. On the morning of the 10th of June, we left our camp at the Stubbs Plantation. 
the cavalry moving out ahead of the infantry, and when Winslow's brigade reached the Bryce's Crossroads, which is going to be in this left-hand map, this area where the, where the roads cross, that's the Bryce's Crossroads, uh, Waring's men were then already engaged on the Baldwin Road, which is the, the northern road here, running right through the center of the map. Winslow's men dismounted and went forward about 800 yards east of the Bryce House, formed in the woods, our line reaching some distance south of the Guntown Road and extending north far enough to bring a part of my regiment out into an open field. And the area he's talking about is right down here. The, the uh, Third Iowa was the extreme right of the Union line, and they did, they stretched across the road, and uh, their right was out into an open field. But the men of Waring's Brigade continued our line northward behind the field and curving to the west, up to and across the Baldwin Road. And this is the Baldwin Road that runs right through the middle here. My company's place in this line was at this field, and I saw the part of the battle which took place at this point and witnessed their heroic bravery on the part of the Confederates such as I had never seen before. We were scarcely in position before the Confederates appeared in our front, and it was with mingled feelings of admiration and dread that we watched them as they emerged from the woods and advanced toward us across the open field. So there, he's talking about this area right here, the extreme con Confederate left was coming across this field toward the position held by the 3rd Iowa. And he continues, Nearer and nearer to us came the men in gray, until we could distinguish the features and see the determination written in every face. And then we met a deadly and merciless fire. The Federal soldiers in the rear of the field were armed with Spencer carbines a magazine gun, the best in use at that time, carrying seven metallic cartridges. And the main image here is just a good generic shot of uh, Union cavalry taken during the war. And this is from the Library of Congress images. This inset image is of a Union trooper. This, and this image was actually taken at Vicksburg. And he is armed with a Spencer repeater. And they, he's right, they were some of the best uh, uh, carbines available at the time of the Civil War. It, it held seven shots, uh, and you could fire literally as fast as you could load a new round into the, into the chamber. You just uh, dropped the uh, loading handle here, pulled it back up to eject around and, and advance the next one. Then you had to manually cock the hammer, and you were ready to fire. And you had seven shots at your disposal that you had to reload. But these were excellent weapons, and uh, uh, Union cavalry armed with them could lay down a very heavy uh, uh, suppressive fire using weapons like that. And he goes on to say, seven shots could be fired in quick su succession without stopping to reload, and that continuous and withering fire met the brave men in gray. But heedless of the thick storm of death, their line continued to advance. No soldiers ever faced the enemy's blazing guns more fearlessly than did the veterans of Forrest Cavalry, who made that desperate charge. The bullets came like swarming bees. Men fell all along the line. It seemed impossible that any living thing could stand in such a storm of lead and iron ball. It was gallantry beyond parallel, but the terrific volleys finally became too much for human endurance. There is a point in battle beyond which human flesh and blood cannot pass. The men in gray reached that point and then retired. Later the Confederates charged here again and drove back the Federal line, but, I, but that I did not see as my regiment had been transferred into another position. The fearless attack at this field was equaled by Forrest, other troops along the line, and everywhere they passed. Uh, forward impetuously and persistently, fighting with desperate bravery. The Battle of Bryce's Crossroads was an exhibition by forest soldiers of grand courage and undaunted valor, which I do not believe was surpassed on either side during the Civil War. About two o'clock there was a lull in the battle. Federal infantry regiments began to arrive, and as Grierson's cavalry had been engaged since 11 o'clock, they were relieved by the infantry and were ordered back and halted in the woods a short distance in rear of where the infantry regiments went into line. 
They were hardly in place before they were attacked with determined fury. The crash of arms was deafening. A perfect hail of bullets from the Confederate side came over my regiment where we lay in line on the ground. I remember noticing the forest leaves cut by rifle balls falling all around almost as thick as snowflakes intending to attack the Confederate flank. Sturgis now ordered the cavalry uh, to return to their horses because I've been fighting dismounted remember and which were being held in the open ground just in rear of the Bryce house and we were there mounted and in line awaiting further orders when broken detachments of infantry came streaming out of the woods in wild disorder and confusion and it was evident that our forces were defeated. And this part, I think, was really in, uh, in, in, uh, impressed on uh, Stanton he, because he, he begins this next portion of the memoir saying, As long as I live, I shall never forget the terrible sight which was presented when the retreat began. It was like a scene from Dante's Inferno, and it might be fitly described with the lurid adjectives which the Italian poet used in his description of hell. So this really made an impression on him. It, he was not going to forget this as long. I mean, he uh, he was I think scarred by by this uh, this action. The battered and beaten fragments of the infantry regiments poured out of the woods, slowly followed by the victorious Confederates who advanced, cheering and firing as they came. And with their front lines came Morton's battery, firing at close range into the retreating Federals. In the open ground west of the Bryce House, the cavalry, aided by some detachments of infantry which still held together, made an effort to repel the Confederate attack and, and check the retreat, but the attempt was not successful. The road back to Tishomingo uh, Bridge was filled with mule teams and wagons, artillery, caissons, ambulances, wounded men, riderless horses, and a mob of disorganized and panic-stricken troops all hurrying to the rear. At the bridge across the Tishomingo, there was indescribable excitement and confusion. And there the Confederates captured all, uh, all that part of our wagon train that had not crossed, and part of our artillery, except Winslow's two guns, was captured that night in the Hatchie Swamp. Darkness came on and enforced a truce between pursuer and pursued. Forrest knew how to gather the fruits of victory, and his pursuit had been relentless and unsparing, but at dark or soon after, he wisely halted long enough to give his men and horses a few hours rest. Sturgis now ordered Winslow to push on with his brigade ahead of the retreating troops and stop them at Stubbs Plantation until they could be formed for another fight. Winslow moved his brigade through the woods, parallel with and near the road, reaching Stubbs' place ahead of the flying army and stopping the, tr the retreat. But later, when Sturgis came up, he made no attempt to reorganize the infantry regiments. He said, quote, the whole thing had gone to hell and ordered Winslow to open the road to the rear, letting the retreating infantry pass and urging them to hurry along. So you basically got a panic-stricken federal force retreating in the face of a very aggressive pursuit by uh, Forrest, who was excellent at aggressive pursuits. And it's going to fall on the cavalry to try and slow down that pursuit and give the infantry, which is moving slow, time to try and get away. And this is where, uh, this is where the, the uh, narrative continues. Stanton says, Winslow's cavalry remained at Stubbs's until two o'clock at night, lighting many fires along the road and in the woods, hoping to deceive the Confederates in the belief that a large force was in camp there. At two o'clock, the road seemed clear, and supposing that all the infantry had escaped capture uh, was safely in front, we went forward on the road to the Ripley. My recollections are still vivid of that fearful night. The air was hot and oppressive, and we were weary and also worn out from lack of food and rest since early morning, and an indescribable feeling possessed us of terrible disaster that, that had overtaken us. 
At daylight, Forrest made a fierce and furious attack upon the rear of our column, and at Ripley, after passing through the town, a part of our cavalry with a detachment of infantry made a stand on the outskirts of the village, but soon forced to give way. And this is just a good period illustration of, of uh, cavalry uh, during the war. This is not not actually depicting Bryce's Crossroads. There are very few uh, period uh, images uh, done of the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, if any. And so you've really got to kind of use other just kind of uh, illustrations that are similar to try and fill in the gaps. But uh, when the retreat from Ripley began, our brigade took the Salem Road with my regiment as rear guard. And just where the road enters the woods northwest of the town, I was ordered to stop with my company and, if possible, check the pursuit long enough to allow my regiment to fall back a short distance and take up another defensive position. We did not remain long. A detachment of the 16th Tennessee, led by Colonel Jesse Forrest, who shown in this inset picture here. He was the brother of Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, char uh, Colonel Jesse Forrest charged us and a hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued in which I lost 23 men of my company. In Jordan's Life of Forrest, he speaks of the fight at the edge of the woods near Ripley, saying, quote, the charge on the Federals was made with such hardihood that the commander of the rear guard narrowly escaped capture. I was the Federal officer to whom he refers. And this inset picture, this is a picture of Stanton taken during the war. So this is him. Uh, I don't know exactly what year this was taken, but this is what he would have looked like at the time of the, the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads. And I was the federal officer to whom he refers, and if any of the 16th Tennessee men at the reunion were in that charge and that fight which followed, they may remember a federal officer who broke away and galloped up the road, closely pursued by three or four Confederates who tried to knock him off his horse and with their empty guns, but he escaped. It was lucky for me that their guns were empty and my horse not quite as jaded as theirs were, or I might not be here now to tell this story. I went into the engagement at Bryce's Crossroads with 35 men in my company. The next day after the fight at Ripley, I had four men left. I may be pardoned for saying here that in spite of the misfortune that overtook me and my company in this campaign, I received soon after a major's commission which dated from the memorable day at Bryce's Crossroads. All day on the 11th and all through another dismal night, we hurried on the cavalry in the rear, protecting the tired infantry soldiers who filled the road ahead of us. Staring along, some of them wounded and almost exhausted from hunger and fatigue, and it was not until we reached Colliersville that we made our first stop for food and rest. On the morning of the 13th, we reached Memphis. And uh, this is an image taken of some uh, Union cavalry in Memphis. This is not the 3rd Iowa Cavalry, but it is an Union infantry, or Union cavalry regiment in Memphis, just I, I thought it might uh, it added a little something to the to the uh, description, but uh, on the morning of the thirteenth we reached Memphis. It had taken us ten days to march from Memphis to Bryce's. We came back over the same road in three days and nights. Our losses in this campaign were twenty one hundred men, sixteen pieces of artillery, fifteen hundred stands of small arms. 300,000 rounds of ammunition, 300,000 rations, 200 horses and mules, 200 wagons and ambulances and other property. For the Federals, it was an utter rout and humiliating defeat. Yet our beaten, disheartened troops were not lacking in soldierly qualities. Their bravery had been tested before and was tested again on other fields where they did not fail. It was the same cavalry that was compelled to retreat from Bryce's and Ripley that afterwards, under other leaders, rendered effective service at Harrisburg, Montevello, Ebenezer Church, Boggler's Creek, Selma, Montgomery, Columbus, and Macon. And unfortunately, I couldn't find any detailed breakdown of casualties by regiment. 
the 3rd Iowa Cavalry had about 545 men engaged in the battle at Bryce's Crossroads. And while there are no breakdown by regiment, there is a listing of casualties for the entire brigade. And in the uh, uh, brigade that the 3rd Iowa belonged to, they had a total of 126 men killed, wounded, or missing. Uh, also, I did find uh, a list of the number of uh, breakdown of casualties of horses in the 3rd Iowa Cavalry. And just to give you an idea of how uh, heavily they were engaged, the 3rd Iowa Cavalry had 19 horses killed, 41 uh, wounded, and 100 had to be abandoned uh, on the field of battle. This kind of gives you an idea of just how fierce the fighting was that they were engaged in. And for the Confederates, Bryce's Crossroads was one of the most dramatic and overwhelming victories of the war. It was an illustration of General Forrest's matchless generalship, of the amazing swiftness and precision with which he formed his plans, and the tenacity of his thunderbolt methods of executing his designs of the genius which entitles him to the rank with the great military leaders of history. Every veteran knows the pride of a soldier feels in the record of his regiment to which he belonged. And the veterans will pardon me, I know, for referring to the fact that my regiment, the 3rd Iowa Cavalry, was one of the regiments that was first in the fight, but retreated in perfect order, and in turn with other regiments of Winslow's and Waring's Cavalry Brigades, formed the rear guard and covered the retreat of the federal troops and continued to fight the Confederate forces uh, until the Confederate forces discontinued the pursuit. What is true of my regiment is also true of other regiments of Grierson's Cavalry Division. And the brigade to which my regiment belonged um, brought through to Memphis two pieces of artillery, our ambulances, and all our wounded men. And this picture is one I found in the newspapers. This is from a 1908 reunion of the 3rd Iowa Cavalry. Uh, I don't know if, it, if uh, Stanton was present at this reunion. He very well might have been, and he might be in this picture, but I'm just not certain. But uh, he goes on to say, To the comrades at the reunion, I would like to say that I am glad that now every true American takes pride in the soldierly qualities and brilliant achievements of the men of Forest Cavalry. They have won renown which will endure as long as history survives. I honor them for the splendid record which they made in the titanic struggle. I honor them for their heroism in battle and their superb manhood in accepting the final result of the war. I honor them for their devotion to duty and loyalty to principle. I wish for them all the blessings in life that noble men deserve and I hope that they may continue to meet and greet in closing ranks in time's defining sun until the bugles of heaven shall sound the recall and the battle of life be won. And he ends at uh, C.A. Stanton, Vicksburg, Mississippi, October 16, 1906. And after reading uh, Stanton's very uh, uh, eloquent account of the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, I thought I would try and find out just a little bit more about the man himself. And uh, I was able to find a good bit of information about him. And shown here in this picture, this is the Iowa Monument that they were dedicating in 1906 that uh, Colonel Stanton was involved with the preparations for the, for the dedication ceremony. And this inset uh, picture is from uh, the Vicksburg Evening Post, uh, November 15, 1906. And Stanton enlisted in the 3rd Iowa Cavalry at the age of 19. He, uh, he becomes a member of Company I, uh, 3rd Iowa Cavalry on September 6, 1861, uh, and he uh, joins at the rank of 5th Sergeant. Uh, and Stanton must have been a very good soldier because he doesn't remain a 5th Sergeant for long. Uh, in, uh, he becomes Sergeant Major of the regiment in July 1862, and then just two months later he was promoted uh, uh, to officer and uh, assumed the rank of 2nd Lieutenant. Uh, he was promoted to captain in the 3rd Iowa in June 1863, and Stanton was uh, shortly thereafter wounded at uh, LaGrange, Arkansas on July 1, 1863. He was able to recover from his wounds and return to the regiment, and then after the, soon ap very soon after the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, he was promoted to major of the 3rd Iowa Cavalry. 
Uh, he mustered out of service on August 9, 1865 at Atlanta, Georgia, and then returned to his home in Iowa. In 1870, I found Stanton uh, living at his home in his hometown of Centerville, Iowa, making his living as a dry good merchant. But sometime between 1870 and 1900, he moved to Vicksburg, Mississippi. Uh, and he was living, still living there uh, in the early 1900s uh, when he went to work for the Houston Brothers Lumber Company. Uh, he was in Vicksburg in November 1906 when the Iowa Monument uh, was dedicated out in the Vicksburg National Military Park. And uh, he wrote a very warm welcome to uh, the, his fellow Iowans that came down for the dedication ceremony. And he said in his welcome, quote, we extend the hand of comradeship and goodwill to the Iowa veterans whose soldierly achievements we have today commemorated, and we rejoice in the fact that the surviving soldiers of the North and South now meet as they did today, and recall the scenes of the Civil War without passion, review its results without regret, and together dedicate the monuments which not only commemorate the valor of Iowa soldiers, but also illustrate the power of endurance, the tenacity of purpose, and the Spartan fortitude and splendid courage of the men who were engaged on the Confederate side in the Vicksburg campaign. And I'm not sure exactly when, but at some point uh, Stanton moved from Vicksburg out to Los Angeles, California, and he was living there when he passed away on December 17, 1912. His body was returned to Iowa, and he was buried in Oakland Cemetery in Centerville, Iowa. And uh, this is a picture of his grave that I found on uh, findagrave.com. And in his obituary, a friend uh, uh, wrote very, very uh, passionately about him. I thought that was a good way to close this, uh, this talk, is uh, just to read this, uh, this obituary. And he says of uh, Stanton, his life was a life of service to his country, his state, his community, his fellow man. He inculcated in his life the highest and purest principles of brotherhood and fraternity. His liberal hand was ever open to the poor, the needy, and the unfortunate. His comrade and long ago friends can see him now as a fair-haired lad, just as he stood on the threshold of young manhood with the glow of youth and health upon his cheek, with eyes turned to the future of bright prospects and rosy dreams. When the toxin of war sounded in his ears, and the cry for help came from his bleeding and distressed country, appealing to the patriotism of the land and to uphold the flag of the Union and to crush the cohorts of treason and rebellion, he thought not of himself and the allurements of life and his peaceful pursuits, but he buckled on his armor and went forth to face all the dreadful realities of war that involved the perpetuity of this government and the great question of human liberty. And I think that's about as good an uh, obituary as someone can hope to get. Um, Stanton led a remarkable life. Uh, he was an excellent soldier, and uh, he fought well for his country. And uh, I think uh, that obituary uh, suits him very well. And uh, this ends another episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please uh, give it a thumbs up and a like. Uh, uh, I hope to have another episode out very shortly. Uh, uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. It really kind of gives me an idea of just how uh, how much feed you know how many people are watching and uh, and and how often I need to try and uh, uh, upload something. But uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and uh, I'll see you again soon.